Even when you're doing a smaller podcast like this one, you get to meet some famous people. How much more so when you are blessed to attend conferences and engage Christian creators via the interwebs? This can, however, bring many temptations, among them the temptation to treat famous creators as if they're angels, or as if they're devils, when of course they're very much human. In the world of fandom, by Christians and often for Christians, let's explore how we're meant to delight and discern famous creators. Welcome back to Fantastical Truth, the podcast from Lorehaven, where we explore fantastical stories for God's glory, and we apply the meanings of these stories to the real world that our author, Jesus Christ, calls us to serve. I'm E. Stephen Burnett, the non-famous publisher of Lorehaven.com and also the co-author of the non-fiction book about fiction called The Pop Culture Parent. And I'm Zachary Russell, and I'm currently battling that devil COVID, but don't worry, the CDC recommends podcasts since you cannot catch Omicron through your headphones. And this is episode 96. While celebrity creators rise and fall, how do we best respect Christian authors? This is the episode in which we name check, name drop all of the famous Christians <laughs> that we've met, including one another. Isn't that right? But it's okay because we're going to lampshade it and challenge the ideas of Christian celebrity, partiality, all that sort of thing. And now I've just gone full meta upon myself. We've already <laughs> talked about like meeting Frank Peretti, the Frank Peretti at uh, the Realm Makers Conference last summer. But there's a few other folks we've met and it got us to thinking, well, especially when a celebrity can prove controversial, this is a good time to address that. Yeah, I think probably my favorite celebrity name drop ever was a friend of mine that they were newly married. They had to go to the store to get a pregnancy test. Uh, and someone else came in line behind him and he, you know, wasn't ready to announce this yet if that's what it was. And then all of a sudden Pierce Brosnan appeared in line behind him somehow, who knows why. And, uh, so his other friend who he was trying to distract got distracted by Pierce Brosnan. And then my friend went on to complete his purchase without anyone the wiser. So, you know, sometimes, uh, God uses celebrities in, in ways to just, uh, it, totally unrelated to stardom or anything. Just like, hey, I need you to talk to this person and get rid of them. Was Pierce undercover as 1990s Agent <laughs> 007? Yes. Maybe I'm just thinking about this because Nintendo 64 uh, games are coming to the Nintendo Switch. But notably absent is GoldenEye, the best Nintendo 64 game ever. And I just can't stop thinking about it. So uh, come on, Nintendo. As... Get whatever done and get that Pierce Brosnan game into Nintendo Switch. I have heard that fans love this. All I know is a CGI shot of him surfing against a wave that is not yet <laughs> aged very well or not ever <laughs> aged yeah. very well. I remember when I was in college and I got to interview some people working for the student newspaper, including a guy who I need not even name drop because chances are folks among our listening audience don't even remember who this guy is. He was uh, originally with the Clinton administration. Uh, he, he switched sides and became for a while a, a rather... Uh, a rather common pundit on some of the more right wing talk shows and such. And I got to talk with this guy and they're just really, really nice guy. You know, I don't know if he was a grifter or what uh, he seemed to have switched sides, honestly. But I remember the time thinking, Oh wow. Like I, I got to meet this guy. Like literally I'm thinking now like, well, I wasn't going to say the name, but there's another reason I, and I'm not going to say the name. I don't remember the name. Uh, <laughs> you Rhyme, have, rhymes with yeah. rhymes with Rick Norris. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But I, I remember uh, like having one of his books, which for some reason had this uh, figure on the front of it with uh, a head of cabbage. And I don't like literally his head was cabbage. That's all I remember is that book cover. Very strange. Celebrities have strange effects on people. Uh, celebrities also can rise and fall, as we said in our title. And uh, even after we started planning this, there was an article that came out this past week, Zach, about Joss Whedon. Uh, the discredited, disgraced, and now self-destructing uh, creator of shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Firefly. And he even got in directing jobs on two Avengers movies uh, before he just is apparently just going full self-immolation now and expecting people to sympathize with his abuse of cast members and things. And by his own admission, like, well, everybody was just so pretty and I didn't know what to do. And I just think it was terrible. The article is absolutely terrible. We might link it in the show notes. And I mentioned him before. And it's just another example of this rise and fall effect. You can show partiality to celebrities, whether they're Christian or non-Christian. 
Uh, they can be the latest, greatest thing, like complete A-list, go to all the fancy parties, rake in the millions of dollars, everybody sings your praises and speaks your name well, you have a great reputation, and then the next moment, you are sitting homeless by the side of the street with a cardboard sign saying, I tried, which was literally a Joss Whedon image that he stuck into his mutilated Justice League movie, showing a homeless guy on the side of the street with a cardboard sign that says, I tried, over his name showing up on screen as as a, like co-director or story credit or something and it is just the biggest meta admission of guilt right then and there gosh well my favorite sci-fi fandom right now is the expanse and notably absent in the final season was an actor for who played the character alex kamal this um indian uh ethnicity they got rid of texan alex? accent uh martian okay. character yes yeah, so the uh the easiest way I could explain it is the actor was Me too uh, Apparently some very uh, terrible behavior towards uh, other people involved in the show and even just fans of the show. Doesn't sound like there were very many safeguards in place in the first place, which I'm going to ding the show for that. And, and I don't know how they handled it when it came to light, but basically they just fired him, which probably the right decision. But then they had to figure out how to write him out of the show and you know this happens with tv shows all the time but it was really funny talking to a friend recently about this because they're like wait a minute where's that character and like is he in the later books because the show ends at book six and there's nine books and i'm like oh yeah he's there all the way to the end of the books uh but the tv show changed it and you know it's just uh it's it's confusing as a fan to like go through that but then you're like well that was the right decision because you got to protect vulnerable people you got to uphold the law if you broke the law and uh it's unfortunate that all this happened because you you just wish you could see something finish by the people you really like it is unfortunate but yes uh, as uh, as the actor ray fisher again from justice league likes to say accountability over entertainment uh, he may go. not be a christian but he has some wisdom there and that statement is just about biblical Speaking of biblical, let's jump to our uh, first sponsor for this episode. Once again, it is us, uh, the Lorehaven Guild, uh, an, an attempted biblical guild uh, to explore Christian fantasy in the form of monthly book quests. We're going to choose a title every month, and then we're going to quest through it via a Discord server that is invitation only for free Lorehaven subscribers. So you can join the guild by going to lorehaven.com. Just subscribe for updates, and then we will send you that super secret link that sends you through a portal uh, into this wondrous realm where you can mingle with other fans, including listeners of this podcast, share inside info, get to know folks, and engage in the book quests. Uh, this week, the week this episode releases, uh, we are finishing our first book quest for The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, of course. And then next week, uh, we have just announced, and we'll be announcing this week as well, but next week, starting at Tuesday, February the 1st, we begin Book Quest the 2nd. This is through a different sort of story, a superhero adventure from H.L. Burke called Power On. Get those links in our show notes. Uh, we start Tuesday, but of course, if you're listening to this episode a few weeks after that, uh, you should just be able to jump in whenever you can. I understand the author has some plans for making the book uh, available uh, over the internet as well. Uh, for uh, I think she's doing a giveaway, but anyway, stop by the Lorehaven Guild. You can get the updates there as well as at uh, lorehaven.com, which is where you can subscribe and get the Guild invite. Well, Zach, you mentioned earlier how unfortunate it can be when you have to fire someone uh, who is a fallen celebrity. Uh, it, the case is very difficult there with someone is literally breaking the law or assaulting people or abusing them in some way. Uh, things get a little bit squishier uh, when you're talking about authors who are just arrogant or celebrities, Christian creators who are either you know arrogant, uh, they fall into some kind of false belief issues, uh, which can in turn affect their stories. Uh, this can lead to some controversy among their fans. What do you do with a person like that? You know, they didn't break the law. They didn't assault anybody. Although there was a case a few years ago where some people in the Christian writing conference circuit we're accused of some behavior like that we won't get into that now here i think our first concession uh very tasty here uh, maybe a little bit stale left over from the stocking that uh, santa left but we're going to try to focus on ideas uh, we might name a person or two like we have already name checked joss whedon mainly because it's just such a big name uh but we're going to try to avoid uh, focusing on specific 
people in the Christian fantasy community. Uh, that should go without saying. Uh, we're not trying to attack anybody here. This is more about the issues. We also have no personal grievance with anybody we name. I, like, I, I've not been in a dispute with Joss Whedon recently, uh, except him ruining one of my favorite movies. And even he was just hired to do that. So I don't know if we can blame him for that. But the reason why I say that is because sometimes when you start talking about people who are incidentally spreading false beliefs or bad behavior, uh, some other well-meaning Christians or just naive Christians, unwise Christians will come along and say, well, have you talked with that person? Have you gone through a Matthew 18 step-by-step -step process of reconciliation with church elders? Like, no, that person is a public actor, a, you know, a person who is known for what they do and what they say. They have nothing to do with me. Therefore, it's not a personal dispute. The biblical commands about reconciliation simply do not apply. This is more like the scenario in which the Apostle Paul is calling out false teachers. The Apostle Peter is saying to his church audience, hey, there's some people out there teaching this, and I want you not to listen to them. They have nothing to do with the apostolic authority to proclaim the gospel. If the apostles can name names, we can certainly name names, although here we choose not to necessarily name names, but we're certainly going to name false teachings and then try to find a better way to respond to Christian creators who might be spreading some false teachings. Do you treat them like an angel? Do you treat them like a devil? Or do you treat them like a human? Perhaps most seriously, anything we say here can and should apply to us. Uh, we are, after all, podcasters. We're not unaware that we have a platform here. Uh, I do have a co-credit on a published book and want to make more books. So could I become uh, subject to this criticism myself? Uh, yes, I, I think we both are, Zach and I, uh, subject to this criticism. Uh, God forbid that Lorehaven or Fantastical Truth fall into these temptations of uh, celebrity abuse or uh, partiality of the kind Scripture condemns. And we'll see how Scripture speaks to this in just a moment. Uh, as for our beliefs, though, uh, just in order to kind of get ahead of this, uh, we actually at Lorehaven uh, went through and upgraded our sacred scrolls. Uh, that's our new name for the faith statement. Just to make absolutely clear uh, where everybody who writes for or creates for Lorehaven stands uh, in regard to the gospel and Christian practice. We will link to that in our show notes. If you see anything on Lorehaven that uh, violates the sacred statement, uh, the sacred scrolls, we want to know uh, because that is a guiding document that we use. We're not a church, but we still want to be shaped by the church. And finally, to explore this topic, uh, we might make comparisons to uh, other celebrities who are not authors, like Joss Whedon. He writes a lot of stuff, but he's not necessarily known for creating Christian fantasy, just a lot of fantasy that Christians like. Uh, I myself may be borrowing just generally from examples of musicians or folks who are not Christian fantastic creators, uh, just so do, we don't step on any toes. Zach, we really don't want to step on any toes here. This is just about the ideas and particularly becoming more like Christ as we deal with some challenging scenarios. Yeah, and I, you know we're trying to base this on scriptural principles. Um, the, the, the verse that's in my mind is 2 Timothy 4, 14 and 15, where Paul says, Alexander the coppersmith did great harm to me. The Lord will repay him according to his works. Watch out for him yourself because he strongly opposed our words. And so, you know, we're, we're going to get into the whole cancel culture thing in a little bit. But um, the focus here is how do we as Christians handle this? Like, what, what do we do amongst ourselves? And a lot of it is just like looking out for each other. Like Paul is saying here to Timothy, just like, hey, look out for this guy. He's going to come after you. But it's not like, hey, let's let's mount an offense and let's go after people and, you know, let's sign a petition and get someone fired or, you know, or uh, or get someone reinstated. You know, it's, hey, you can do that, I guess, if you want. But the, the point is, um, how do we as fans kind of approach these topics? I think the first principle we have as we approach these topics, uh, before we get to my three point outline here, the first principle we have is avoiding what the Apostle James calls the sin of partiality. Now, I think this is the keystone text here. As we're talking about celebrity, we're not saying that uh, some folks ought not be more talented or more popular or more successful or even more wealthy than others. We are not saying that. Uh, even uh, Jesus and the Apostles draw examples throughout their teaching. They draw examples of people who have some things and more than others, uh, whether it's fame or reputation or material goods. They just assume this is going to happen, but it matters how Christians respond to this. Do we enjoy the gifts for God's glory or do we abuse them for our own self-glory? This is what the Apostle James says in chapter 2, starting with verse 1. He says, quote, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. 
For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, You sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, You stand over there, or sit down in my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? End quote. The Apostle James goes on. That is one of my favorite texts, and especially when I'm working with Christian creators or trying to make my own stuff or going to a writer's conference, I want to have that text in the back of my head because although it's not a church, and James here is talking, I think, specifically about Christians getting together for uh, a church service for the teaching, the singing, a writer's conference is still a Christian type event if it's being led by Christians. And I want to keep these rules in my mind. And I've literally had scenarios where like I've, I've sat down with like, you know, the, the, somebody I don't know, you know, which by comparison here would be the poor man, you know, it's not material poor necessarily. It's just, you know, this is a stranger. I don't know this person, you know, maybe this is a, a more obscure author. And then, you know, I look across the room and then there's um, XYZ, you know, who's written this book I really love, you know, who's obviously gone full time, which is the magic state. You know, if you're a full time author, oh, the choir sing uh, and this person wins all the things. And I look over and go, wow, I'd, I'd like to get I'd like to get to know to that person. You know, maybe we could have them on Fantastical Truth sometime. I want to have that check in my mind and in my heart not to react that way. I don't want to be tempted to show partiality. This person may not have a gold ring, but they have this, this, uh, this ring, the inner ring is what Lewis calls it. You want to get into the inner ring, the room where it happens, as they say in Hamilton. Uh, these can be very tempting impulses, and that's what we're going to explore. So from there, let's go to chapter one of our discussion, the one where we say the author is an angel, and come let us adore him. Come let us adore him or her. Uh, Christians do love supporting our favorite authors, and that can bring some temptations. And we're very aware of those here at Lorehaven. Uh, I think to borrow from the music industry scene, uh, we've all seen and scoffed at the Beliebers. Remember about 10, 15 years ago mm -hmm. or so, all the Justin Bieber fans. Uh, we've been familiar with the whole groupy uh, impulse for quite a while. But I've also seen similar groovy behavior for Christian authors at conferences. It just happens. You know, somebody's book just came out. It's up for an award. Folks are going to flock around that person and you know, maybe want to catch some wind from the successful author's sales. You know, they're the captain uh, and you are the sailor just along for the ride. And, you know, hey, maybe you get to you know, get an in with that person. Uh, I was uh, speaking with a, a Christian author, um, a good, good Christian author, uh, seems resistant to these types of things. Uh, but uh, this person was also mentioning to me sometime last year, he was mentioning that tendency at writers conferences, you know, where people will talk about what a great book you wrote and all that, but they're really just kind of interested in getting the name of your agent. And I just do a little face palm when I hear stuff like that, because I mean, yes, I know I may be frightfully naive here, but I want us to enjoy stories and creativity and meeting authors and sharing that stuff for not for the story's own sake, but for God's sake. Like, you know, I don't want us to show partiality and use people in order to get ahead. And that's a constant temptation whenever Christians are doing anything, you know, in the smallest local church, you can imagine there's going to be a little bit of a, a pecking order. The most we can do to mitigate that, I think, the better. Zach, I will say, and uh, you've seen this as well because we've both been to Realm Makers, like many Christian communities of creators are the exception to this, uh, and which is really, really great. Realm Makers, I think, is an exception to this uh, so far as I've seen it. Everybody at Realm Makers seems pretty chill and humble and uh, story-focused in what they're doing. And I've noticed that even when they get celebrity authors, uh, whether or not they're Christians, uh, to, uh, Terry Brooks, remember Terry Brooks was there in 2019, I think it was, like just the downright approachable guy. He wrote the Sword of Shannara series. I think I pronounced that correct. And I know that famous people, like one of the things that they deal with just as part of the job is that they often are just very busy and they have to steward their time well. That's how they got where they are. That's how they got to be successful. Yet I think the ones with the biggest hearts uh, who are least tempted to the dangers of celebrity want to share their time as much as they can. Uh, last year, uh, Peretti at Realm Makers, like he was just mingling with people. He was just, he was just out. He was just, he would make appearances. He'd say hello. You know, folks would walk up and tell him how much they loved his books. 
And yet folks gave him space. Folks respected his space. Like I noticed that it was a vibe I kind of caught on to, even if I hadn't had that impulse. And I appreciated seeing that, you know, and I'm sure he appreciated that as well. I hope that's how he felt afterwards. I think he had a great experience at Realm Makers. And yet he was also open to uh, people like Laura McCary. Remember, she came up last summer and she said, hey, we're going to do this fun little video with uh, with uh, Instagram for Lorehaven. And like, we're going to act like we're spying on you while you're talking to Steven. And then we want you to just look at the camera and notice. And then I'm going to run away. Uh, and you can see that video on our Instagram feed right now. Uh, that was a, it was a great little trick. And of course, only Laura could pull that off. Similarly, I think like even if I don't talk to celebrities, I mentioned uh, here's another name drop. Um, Mike Naraki, the creator of uh, co-creator of VeggieTales, a uh, voice of Larry the Cucumber. I saw him at the Realm Makers bookstore in Nashville last spring. I was just passing through because I was on my way to my dad's funeral. And he was super busy. And I could tell, though, that if I like, you know, tagged him and said, hi, I'm Steven, big fan. Thanks for Larry. You know, thanks for the Dead Sea Squirrels. Like, thanks. For, I'm glad you can make it. You know, it probably would have worked out great, you know, but he was just super, super busy. Uh, I'm grateful for communities that mark an exception uh, to that. And of course, I want Lorehaven as well. Uh, this podcast, the Lorehaven Guild, to also encourage uh, that exceptional environment. Uh, we are, for example, we'll say a little bit more about this at the end of the show, but next month, as we approach our 100th episode, uh, we're having some fairly famous folk on here, which, uh, I mean, Christian famous anyway, evangelical famous, but including a few names that I grew up, uh, you know, knowing about and, you know, hearing about, uh, which is, which is very cool. No, we, we aren't getting Frank Peretti. Uh, that would be cool. Uh, but, uh, we, we wish him well. That's something that we're keeping in mind and we, we want to be the exception. We want to promote that biblical view, respect for creators, but also hey, give them their space. You know, don't try to use them. Don't try to climb on them to get somewhere else yourself. I, I think book fandom is inherently less um, insane than like movie fandom. Or well, it's less star. music or immediate. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a cooler media. Well, it, it's because you're not thinking of the author really as you're reading a book, you're thinking of the characters. And so you're, you're getting attached to the characters in the story. You're not really like, you may not even know what the author looks like, but you, you could probably draw a picture of what the characters look like. Um, if you're a, if you're a drawer, but it is always interesting to meet an author and go, oh, you look, you look and sound nothing like I expected. So I think it's more of just like curiosity than anything. Um, I do think this changes a little bit when you, you get into the, um, the, the Christian sphere of movies or maybe YouTube stars or Christian comedians. Um, we do get a little bit more starstruck because it's like you're used to just seeing them on your, your computer screen, your iPhone screen. And then, hey, you're seeing them in real life and it's kind of overwhelming. But I would say, I mean, I hope this is true, but I, I think it's true is that I think Christians are a little bit more immune or at least the Christian fandom is a little bit more immune to the uh, b- the uh, believer <laughs> mentality. Well, we have a bit of a resistance thanks to the Apostle James and others in, in the epistles. Yeah. Um, I, I also think there's something about it that th- there's sort of a, an alternative uh, angle to Christian fandom. So, okay. To, to explain this a little bit, like I, I grew up, I'm basically a native Austinite, uh, which yes, I, I wear like a badge of honor all the time for all these people moving here <laughs> from the coast. But, uh, you know, Austin is all about keep Austin weird and growing up here. I, I've shared this before, but it was all about independent music or alternative music as opposed to pop music, you know, uh, that you hear on the radio. And it was all about discovering things that people had never heard of before, um, which of course then became popular and then you have to go find something else. But that mentality of, of looking for kind of the hidden gems of music, it's really carried over into my mentality. And I've noticed a similar thing among Christian fans of, of Christian movies and, and television and, and so forth. It's like, oh, not a lot of people know about this. And it's more about introducing friends to these kind of alternative fandoms. And, and that's almost more exciting than it is to actually meet the creator. I don't know, because we, I guess we figure we never will, but you know what? I've, I've definitely fallen into this. I, I met Michael Jr., a Christian comedian, uh, this summer at a conference. And that was, re- I was totally starstruck because I got to hear him live a few years ago and I've listened to a bunch of his routines and then I just ran into him and it was just, it was really funny. I uh, asked him to record a video for me for a, a, a really good friend of mine that's like a super fan of Michael Jr. And so he starts recording. He's like, yeah, I got this uh, guy here, Zach. He's kind of creepy. 
<laughs> and he starts like making fun of me the whole video. Excellent. And, Roasted and I, by Michael oh, Jr. Oh, but I Very loved Christian it. comedian Michael Jr. Yes. Oh, I totally loved it. It was just great. And so uh yeah, I but again, it was like, okay, then we just went our ways. I didn't, you know, it wasn't it wasn't really weird, but it was uh it was just normal. And I I think Christians have a bit of immunity to that believer, you know, mentality. If you find your normalcy, if you mature into normalcy, then I think I'm still sorting through how to communicate this part just on a personal level. But like even going back to when I was in college and like I went on a campaign bus with the guy who was running for governor, that didn't end up going very well. Uh, He ended up being a rather disgraced governor afterwards, as I recall. Like he seemed to be a pretty down to earth fellow, you know, just doing his job, you know, doing radio interviews from the back of the bus, which was pretty special and technologically significant in the early 2000s. Interesting experience. But I think even back then, I thought I want to be that person who isn't gushing, you know, who's who, who's who's not a gadfly, who's not that weird kind of fanboy, even though I want to have the enthusiasm. You know, if I were to meet a celebrity author or a celebrity actor or somebody uh, I would just want to be the one to share the enjoyment of making the art of, of enjoying those stories. Cause a lot of actors, for example, like they're big movie fans. I mean, uh, they, they like talking about movies and stories and shows that they're not even a part of making. That's how they got into that business in the first place. And I think that it, that's at least slightly better than, uh, pursuing the vapidity of celebrity, which I'm sure for the wise celebrities that can wear pretty thin, even though they know they have to play the game to stay in the job. Uh, I think it's better than to focus on the art itself. Uh, and then of course, better still is to focus on the giver of imagination, the giver of the creativity, which is Christ himself. Uh, the further we get from that, uh, the more we end up disordering the gift, uh, even disordering the gift of fame and fortune and talent and all of that. I think another disorder that results here, uh, and this is where it gets a little bit dicey, so everybody hang on your hats a little bit here. Uh, when a, an, um, I'll just go ahead and say it, when an author, uh, like a Christian author, starts to wander in terms of their belief, and we're not talking about you know, acts of abuse or arrogance or anything like that, but if they start to wander from the gospel or from consistent gospel application in a world that's constantly resisting that, People who are fans of the author or who just respect the power of the author uh, might start making excuses for them uh, or might not recognize that there is a problem. Uh, I don't think that this is a problem unique to people who just worship the author and like, well, that's your problem. You're too much in their celebrity. Uh, I think it's more of an overregard for the creativity or the power, uh, particularly if someone's a full time author and seems to be getting movie deals and doing pretty well. Um, you might see that and you think, well, they're doing something wrong. They're influencing the world for Jesus, you know, like, so what if they believe this over here? Uh, so what if they're affirming this or that, you know, that they're doing more for the kingdom and you are because they're the celebrity author and you are not. So uh, what gives, you know, and by the way, have you talked to that person? <laughs> uh, I think that that is a very unbiblical way to approach it. Uh, if the apostle Paul had approached it that way, he would not have called out Alexander the coppersmith. You know, he didn't say, Oh, there was a situation in Corinth where this went on. He said, no, it's that guy over there. And that's his job, which meant you know where he lives. The Apostle Paul is calling for a kind of cancellation. Like, please, please ignore Alexander. He is not a good dude. And I don't mean uh, Alexander, uh, the faithful disciple you know, over here uh, in Ephesus. I mean, Alexander, the coppersmith. That's the one. Call him out. Don't follow that guy. Uh, don't enable his false teaching. Uh, I think this is easier with secular authors. Like if, if you see Stephen King, you know, that guy's not a Christian. And if you're listening yeah, to a secular vocalist, say that. yeah, well, that's guy not, a, that, that guy's yeah. not a Christian. We don't have to, you know, it does what it says on the tin. You're not going to read a non-Christian's book and expect Christian stuff. And then, oh no, you know, he affirms gay marriage. I'm going to cancel him. But it gets, uh, it gets more challenging with Christian authors because yes. they do believe Jesus. They say all the right things and they may even be true Christians. I'm not talking about heresy here. But then they're going off and saying, oh, well, I actually have come to believe this or, you know, well, I believe that God is actually, you know, in the world and inside of us all along and we just need to follow our light. Like, please don't justify that stuff. Please don't yeah. justify that stuff. 
I, I think maybe a better person than Alexander the coppersmith is Demas, who Paul mentions in 2 Timothy 4.10. He says, Demas has deserted me since he loved this present world and has gone on to Thessalonica. I, I think there's a word that, that really summarizes what, there's two words here, Stephen, that really summarize what's going on. I think the first word is syncretism to describe what, we, what we're talking about with certain Christian authors and celebrities. And then there's betrayal is the other word is that, you know, Paul felt betrayed by Demas. He said, Demas deserted me. He was working alongside me, and then he, then he wasn't because he loved this world. And that's, that's what I, unfortunately, I've seen, uh, I've seen Christian musicians, I've seen Christian comedians, I've seen, not Michael Jr., <laughs> I've yep. seen other, he's, he's other, other so Christian far. comedians, yes, I've seen Stay Christian Stay in authors. the faith, Michael Jr., if you're yes. listening. <clears throat> I've seen Christian uh, movie celebrities, and yeah, what, what seems to be going on is syncretism. It's like they're, they they haven't outright rejected the Christian faith, but they're trying to add to it these worldly idols that are very in vogue and very popular. And if you don't embrace them, you could get canceled in certain, you know, uh, celebrity circles. And so I, I think they're trying to hold on to Christ and <laughs> it's, as Laura says, they're trying to hold on to Christ and the Asherah pole at the same time. Uh, maybe not in their personal behavior, but at least in what they approve of. And, you know, it really is this sense of betrayal that I feel. Uh, I, I can only speak for myself. Um, it, it's like, hey, wait a minute. We were all standing against this tidal wave of, of sexualityism, of secularism, of, you know, just the politicization of everything. And why are you giving into this? Oh, I see. It's because you're getting the approval of people sending the tidal wave. And so it, it, it just feels like you've abandoned us, like you've abandoned us to stand alone when you could have used you know, your power and influence to push back on this tidal wave. So, you know, it, it doesn't make me want to cancel these people because it's like, well, if I still enjoy their work, I still enjoy their work. I'm not, I can't not enjoy something, but it kind of makes me listen or read or watch less uh, of when this happens. Yeah. I think we should have the freedom to make those decisions. And we'll, we'll talk in chapter three here in a little bit about how Christians can better respond uh, when authors, creators of Christian made stories are wandering like that. Um, I really appreciate that honesty. It's okay to feel betrayed. It's okay to feel like, you know, Anakin yelling down the lava slope, you are the <laughs> chosen one, Anakin. <laughs> you know, that's natural to feel that way. Don't be so spiritual that re you refuse to feel that way. Uh, and right. I think certainly don't be so spiritual as to go, well, that person is impacting the kingdom. Like w with what? With syncretism? You know, you're, yeah. you're, you're telling the world's lies back to them, or at least you're kind of smiling with indulgence uh, rather than either avoiding the topic entirely uh, or, or confronting it as I think a Christian artist will need to do. Christian artists are meant to confront and reflect reality. Uh, your allegiance uh, as a, if you are a Christian artist, your allegiance is to the capital A artists. And yet when you're working your art, you're making your stuff in this world. Uh, I think Christian creators can get into creative circles and their unique temptations uh, among the, the right brain, you know, the, the myth that people are, you know, using their imagination more. Uh, I can understand that the temptation is going to be very strong uh, to go along with these very in vogue beliefs, like particularly about uh, the growing acceptance of sexualityism, which people call affirming and the people call love, which is, which is not love. You're, you're telling people, to deny God's created order. And you're saying when the Bible says this is a sin that Jesus would have to die for, you're effectively saying, no, it's not. Uh, and that is a grave error. And it's not the only grave error you can make, but I don't see a whole lot of political religious movement right now uh, forcing upon culture uh, indulgence and overeating and things like that. You know, yes, Christians can enable gluttony, but there's not a, a, you know, a lobby trying to enforce gluttony you know, effectively from the top. This is the struggle that we have now. In Earth 2, in Earth 2 the Christian artists are struggling with the, uh, with the gluttony alliance that's going on. But that's not what's going on in the real world. And art, artists and authors need to engage the real world. And unfortunately, the real world can make you worldly if you engage it a little too closely. Once more, Zach, and listeners are not talking necessarily about heresy here. I'm not calling anybody a heretic. I'm not calling anybody anything because I'm not even mentioning names right now. But I, the word I use is wandering. Wandering means you can wander back. Not all who wander are lost. Hey, I said the thing, right? 
But <laughs> if you keep wandering and wandering and watering, you are going to get lost, particularly if you are not part of a biblical local church, which I think is some of the big issue here, Zach, with even some of the Christian comedians and singers and all of that. You know, they're on the road all the time. How can they possibly uh, be faithful to a local church? And even if they are in a local church and attending every Sunday, maybe it's a giant local church where you can kind of get lost in the crowd. Or maybe your pastor is so starstruck that, oh, wow, you know, uh, uh, Jim's a popular Christian singer. You know, he, he's, he's been on the top 10 and all the little CDs they put out in the 1990s and the 2000s. Like, maybe I can learn from him. You know, maybe he can make me famous too. Like, so many temptations there. And anyone in leadership, including Christian authors, does bear the responsibility that I think Scripture ascribes to teachers. Mm. The Apostle Paul says, not everybody should be a teacher. There's going to be temptations. Please be careful. Watch yourself. Uh, anybody who's in leadership is going to be responsible for more. I think sometimes uh, well-meaning Christian fans can try to get the author off the hook. They're not a pastor. They're not a teacher. No, but they are a discipler. Every Christian in some kind of leadership, whether it's creative or local church leadership, is involved in discipleship. And yes, the stories are part of discipleship. No matter whether the story is John 3.16 in it or a character getting saved or even overt Christian virtues, the story from a Christian is a discipleship tool in some way. And so if you're going to disciple others, if you're going to say, hey, I have a thing, I can be a leader, I have this talent, like, why don't you buy my book? Then that person is responsible in some way for what is in the book. And I think that Christian creator needs to be very careful to watch their lives and doctrines closely and make sure that they're not wandering from the faith, that they're being consistent with God's word. I, I think what you said about uh, the real key for Christian creators is to continue or to even increase your involvement in a local church. And I've, I've begun to see um, Christian creators' comments about the church as sort of the the warning sign that they're headed into uh, wandering or syncretism or just outright heresy. Well, that key word is, I don't like the institution. They're always whining about the institution. Yes, I was thinking of a very viral tweet recently where someone uh, said this, that, uh, you know, but basically kind of caricaturizing the, the church and, and sort of rejecting it. And it's like, man, that that is going to make so many people quit their membership at churches. And, and yeah, and he's just that guy who did that is discipling people. But, you know, I, I coined a phrase for this a few years ago. It's friendly fire. There was a, a blogger I really enjoyed years ago, and I started noticing a lot of friendly fire uh, from this, from this blogger towards the local church. And, you know, it wasn't simply like, um, Hey, the, the church could do better in this. It's like the church is bad. And it was just very accusatory. Maybe your church was bad. Maybe they were bad because yeah. you were a celebrity. Or maybe you're a unique personality and had a unique bad experience, and you're foolishly projecting that all over everybody else. Right. And, you know, th this person's uh, journey is not going to be everyone's journey, but I, I have seen this pattern play out before where it starts off with uh, this just very heavy-handed critique of the church, and then it leads to all these other things, and and now just not walking in the faith and and just becoming a secular author, basically, and and going through a divorce and going through any number of things uh, with their faith. And so, yeah, you know, uh, hey, hey, fellow Christians, like, get involved in your church. Like, go to church, get in a small group. That's the best thing we could ever tell you on this podcast, uh, because we're not your disciplers. Like, your your local church, your local pastor, they're your disciplers. So get involved. I am always encouraged uh, in the, the Christian authors whom I meet, I'm always encouraged when they are just obviously involved with the local church. Mm. They will just, you, you can tell even if they don't say, well, I was in church this Sunday and the sermon was X and I met with blah, blah, blah. You can just tell based on their behavior, based on when they go dark on social media, you know, any of their things that they post, uh, you, you can tell that they are in discipleship. And of course, some Christian authors are themselves pastors or married to pastors. Uh, and that I find a great encouragement. It doesn't make you immune to false teaching or bad behavior. Uh, it does, won't keep you from being an arrogant celebrity who does false teaching in their books, but it will, I think, build up the resistance. Uh, it will increase the chances that you're in a community to which you are accountable uh, to grow, to be more like Jesus and to grow in his truth and not just in a community that looks up to you uh, as the singing star uh, or the star author. 
Well, speaking of threats from celebrity or partiality or, say, killer robots, let's jump to sponsor two of this episode once more, the science fiction novel Awakened from novelist T.E. Bradford. Here is the description. What if your worst enemy was your only hope? What if saving your life meant destroying your beliefs? How far would you go to survive? MACs, manufactured anodic commandos, were designed for battle. Most people believe sending robotic soldiers into combat is better than risking human lives. But Kara has seen what happens when unfeeling soulless automatons decide who lives and who dies. Machines don't care whether the enemy is holding a rake instead of a gun or that a six-year-old girl watches from a bedroom window. All they know is what they were programmed for, destruction. When Kara finds herself wounded and defenseless in the middle of a battle zone, she has no choice but to use the only weapon she can find, a disabled MAC. Without him, she won't make it out alive. With him, she might come out a different person. Will hate destroy her, or will the natural love of a creator for its creation open her eyes to a truth that changes everything? Get the links, cover, and description for Awakened from T.E. Bradford in our show notes for this episode 96 or at lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors. So we know not to treat authors, Christian creators like angels who can do no wrong. Let's adore them. Let them lead us. Here, you have a cloak. You have a gold ring. You have wealth and riches and fame. Uh, Take control of this heap of rubble. And by the way, try to get some more people saved because we're kind of dying out here. We don't want to treat Christian creators like that. But we also don't want to treat them like this either. Chapter two, we don't want to say the author is a devil. Send their foul books back to the abyss. Uh, It's not just a response to cancel culture, Zach, because, you know, from a safe distance so far, uh, some Christians can look at cancel culture and go, well, we don't want to do that. You know, they're rude, like they're overreacting to the author saying something insensitive and therefore all their books need to be thrown into the fire. Uh, In response to creative or legitimate doctrinal differences with Christian creators, we can go too far. Uh, In the evangelical world in the past, we've got to admit this, and we've talked about it on Lar Haven's Fantastical Truth, that we see people boycotting fantasy for unbiblical reasons. Uh, We see people go, oh, no, that story has magic in it, and therefore it violates the occult rules in the Bible. Like, you know, let's not do anything with that. Uh, We had uh, James uh, Hannibal on here last year talking about Uh, Some very concerned and overreacting evangelicals back in the 80s uh, who got all riled up and they decided to cancel the Christian discipleship learning adventure game Dragon Raid, uh, which is now being rebranded as Light Raiders for a new generation. Christians can overreact to legitimate differences creatively or doctrinally that are allowed within God's people. And they can act like you've just denied that Jesus is God or that Jesus came in the flesh. Uh, That's a very real risk, and I don't want to commit that even as we encourage uh, others uh, not to treat authors like angels. We don't want to treat them like devils either. I'll come right out and say, okay, yeah, we are dealing with uh, the redeeming love controversy a little bit here. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen both sides here. Okay, so real quick. Both sides of the argument of whether to watch it or not. Well, also both sides of, oh, it's an angel or it's a devil. Okay, yeah. Um, In this case, it's it's not a fantasy novel. It's a Francine Rivers uh, historical romance, originally published, I think, by a secular publisher uh, and then revamped and maybe cleaned up a little bit, de-steamified for the evangelical market. It was very popular, uh, sort of an adaptation of the Hosea Gomer uh, theme from the Bible, a true story made into a historical romance. And so it's got, I'll just come out and say it like, you know, it's got a prostitute. It keeps going back to the prostitution because that's the only life she knows. And then the good man who tries to save her. And it's been adapted into a movie now. And the movie apparently by all reputable accounts includes sensuality, on-screen sensuality, actors getting naked or part naked in order to act out the story, which is not just Cap Stewart will tell you, but I think wise Christian entertainment discerners will tell you. Uh, That's a no-no. We've got to love our neighbors from a distance, the actors, and not expect them to disrobe for our amusement. Uh, This is a serious issue with the movie, and yet Christians are kind of lining up on both sides. Hey, lots of people like the book. Lots of people are going to get saved because of the movie. They're angels. Lay off. And then other people want to cancel it entirely and act like the author is bad or fiction is bad or movies are bad. Um, I think either one of those is an unbiblical extreme. And I I don't know, I mean, I don't care about the movie anyway, you know, whether it's G-rated or PG-13 rated, uh, but I think it would be a wrong response, say, to try to cancel the book's author. Now, 
Maybe she meant well. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, When in doubt, don't treat them like a devil. Treat the actual devil like a devil. Uh, Everybody else is just a dead in sins sinner uh, or a struggling Christian. Uh, We need not call someone evil uh, when another biblical label works just as well. And I've been testing the waters with this, and I, I'm, I need to work through my thoughts on this, but I think we need to recover that biblical divide, not just between good and evil and not just between love and hatred, but between wisdom and foolishness. You can say that someone was foolish or maybe even a fool and not say that they're evil and disgusting uh, and a devil. Uh, I think we've got to be kinder, even when we're saying, well, that was a very foolish choice. That was not workable. It was unrealistic. Uh, It has bad consequences. It was not well thought through for the situation. Uh, Never attribute to malice, I think, uh, what can be explained by plain human failing. And that is not an insult. I think that that's a way to look at it with kindness. You know, it's interesting, redeeming love, just to park on that for a second. um, The reviews are completely inverted. The critics give it 11% approval. The fans give it 95% approval. Uh, but then you start digging through the, uh, you know, so it's obviously the fans of the book that are going to see it that love it. Uh, but then you look at even the reviews and it's getting criticized both for being too Christian and for being too sexualized. And so I, that's you know, amazing. My, what a world. Right. And so my, <laughs> you know, my comment is I, I don't think this film really knew what it wanted to be, that it, it kind of wanted to, you know, split the difference between a, a Christian audience and a, and a secular audience. Yeah, but a was, committee was, problem there. Yeah. Yeah. It's it sort of designed by committee, but um, yeah, there, there's a case to be made to not go see that film. And so I'm going to use this as an example, uh, but at the same time, not make a big deal about it. Uh, I think the temptation is always to kind of announce our disassociation with an author, creator, or, or artistic product. You know, we're, we're in the age of social media virtue signaling. So it's all about announcing to the world, oh, I've blocked this person or I've, I've canceled my this or that or the other, you know, it's just, it's so tempting. I'm it's helping. So, so easy. Yeah. It's really easy. It's, uh, you know, I, I've certainly done this, but, um, I don't think it really does anything productive. I think it's better just to quietly dissociate and then pray for the person, um, that that's wandering or that's, uh, or made something awful or objectionable you might even be on the same page doctrinally with, with a creator, but just look at what they've made and go, eh, that's just not good for this reason, or it's offensive for that reason. Yeah. It may not be evil, but it is unwise yeah. and or foolish. <laughs> you know, in, in a culture of people getting roasted online, even if they're not getting canceled, everything gets roasted online. And I, I think that Christians should do a better job of not doing, not partaking in that kind of ritual you know, announcing to the world that you, you're not like one of those Christians, you know, I'm, I'm not like these guys. I think that's really foolish, uh, because it, it sets you up for a trap. First of all, Jesus said, by the measure you judge others, you will be judged. And so if you, you announced to everyone that you no longer support this or that, or you think this is terrible, well, that is going to be used against you. Like guarantee it. Cause again, we are in the age of social media where there is no secrets anymore. Like every, Everything that is whispered in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. And so, look, if you want to cancel, if you want to stop watching or reading something, that's totally fine. Like, but just think twice about how you proclaim that online. Well, in my uh, in my wild youth, I would negatively review Christian novels uh, whose authors I felt were not orthodox. Uh, or the corny ones that just needed to be roasted because they were just so bad. Uh, I think the closest we've gotten to that approach on this podcast was a uh, episode last fall where we were talking about the shack. I was actually re-listening yeah. to that one, and I've got issues with the the shack. At least the author on the cover uh, is, by his own admission, not an Orthodox Christian. He's not mm. just left evangelicalism; he has left biblical Christianity. Once he affirms certain beliefs about universalism or things like that then you have jumped the spiritual shark. Uh, You're no longer in the faith and you need to repent and please come back. You know, there are chances to come back uh, always, always. Uh, If if you mess up, even if you have painted yourself into a corner with your social media shares, Jesus will always take you back. That's not as much of a problem as you think it needs to be. Uh, You may lose some cred uh, with your new, you know, affirming friends, uh, but, you know, wouldn't it be better to lose uh, their cred and then get cred from Jesus, credited righteousness to your account. Uh, Please come back. That's why I always liked what John Piper said to Rob Bell is farewell, Rob Bell. 
That's how I read it. Not yeah, good riddance, you loony. Uh, I want farewell. That is a good word, but it also implies separation. And there's an implicit invitation in there to come back. And I repeated that phrase when I wrote a few years ago about Josh Harris. You know, farewell, Josh Harris. Please, you know, peace and long life. Live long and prosper. You know, and then please come back to the church. Please, please farewell. Yeah, I mean, I think it made more sense in the case of Piper, though, because he and Bell had been, you know, on this shared the same stage and what and whatnot. And so, so I think if you have been publicly supporting someone and then you've decided in your heart, I can't support them anymore, then maybe, then maybe then, yes, you should publicly state your withdrawal of support. And it doesn't have to be mean. It does, like you said, it doesn't have to be cruel. It can just be, you know what? I, I've parted ways with this person. That's fine. You know, Stephen, something I've I've been really curious about recently, though, there seems to be this, uh, uh, I feel like I'm hearing these like mutterings in the shadows about either Lewis uh, and, and in some ways Tolkien, but almost more so Lewis. M- maybe it's just a hunch that's going nowhere, but I feel like there's going to be a cancel campaign eventually for these guys. They are devils in waiting, huh? Yeah. Well, so the, the very first uh, glimmer I got of this was, I think it's just flat out jealousy that uh, these men continue to have influence. Uh, so people try to minimize, you know, how important or brilliant these men were. The next phase of that I saw was this kind of whispering campaign to say, well, Lewis's portrayal of Susan was problematic in the, in the last battle and this whole thing about makeup and, you know, whatever dresses. Yuck, and, there's that word again, problematic. It's yes. what you say when you want to call something sin, but you want to be passive aggressive. Yeah, it is a very passive aggressive word. I, I don't know if any of this will ever catch on, but I, I feel like there's some momentum building. And again, I think it's really based in that um, jealousy of their influence and just wanting to supplant them. But I've been like quietly, <laughs> maybe this is because Dr. Seuss got canceled, but like I've been quietly buying up the Lewis and Tolkien books I didn't own and uh, just saying, you know, hey, maybe these are going to these are going to get expensive one day. Not that I'd sell them, but like it might be harder to come by it later. I don't know. Maybe that's a poverty mindset I've got. Maybe that's paranoia. But when we have Christians sort of betraying other Christians because of a worldly line of thinking, you know, who who knows what's going to happen? And hey, these guys aren't around to defend themselves. So I don't think Lewis would get on Twitter <laughs> anyway. Oh, can you imagine? I mean, no, there's a C.S. Lewis on Twitter account uh, here yeah. and there, but they're they're not actually you know, tapping into his new words it's just stuff from his material and i think one of them got sold to a clickbait farm or something so by the way just let the record show that we uh, drew near to the end of this segment with zach encouraging everyone to buy more books uh, yeah. be a bit a literary surprise prepper. we're not saying don't buy <laughs> books necessarily we're saying buy more books like and by the way we don't say i mean this is part of the way of, of dealing with uh, an author not treating him like a devil um i think that is one of the big issues and we'll get to this in a moment here is that uh people fear that you're going by criticizing an author's belief or his wandering that you're going to call for him to be canceled or for all of his books. And then what do you know, this author who has spent decades developing his craft and doing nothing but developing his craft is out of a job. Uh, It's not just that the author is, uh, is uh, no longer famous, but is no longer able to earn a living because they have spent decades doing nothing on their resume except author stuff. Uh, that's really hard to get back once you've lost it. And so I can understand people wanting to dig in and say, no, don't cancel him. It's okay. He may affirm this. Uh, he may believe this. Uh, he may uh, not believe in Jesus or the Holy Spirit anymore, but he's still a Christian. So support, support, support your brothers in Christ, even though he doesn't believe in Christ or believe that Christ is inside each and every one of us. I'm sympathetic to that. But at the same time, it doesn't mean I have to buy his books any more than usual. Uh, It doesn't mean I'm called to some sort of special support measures because it's a Christian. In that case, that author just becomes like any other, I mean, effectively like any other secular author. Uh, I'm not called to support that person any more than I'm I'm called to support a secular author. So it's just, uh, it leads closer to our, our third chapter here, we'll get to in just a moment, of seeing authors as human. I just wanted to briefly mention that, Zach, you were mentioning like not making a big deal out of like, I blocked this person, you know, he's anathema. You know, you would only do that uh, like Piper did in the kindest way possible, I feel. You would only do yeah. that if you'd had a previous association with that person that everybody knew about. And right. it's, a, it's a call of wisdom. You know, what, what are the pros and cons of doing this? And, you know, should you do it in your local church or should you put it on the social media for everybody to know? I, I think Piper may have made the right call there. 
Uh, at Lorehaven, I mean, not to compare ourselves necessarily, but there have been some books that people have wanted us to review or some other situations already, even in our short history, where we take a look, we even just do a bit of casual vetting and we go, I don't think this person is an Orthodox Christian. Like, I, I don't think that this is the kind of story we want to especially support because Lorehaven does not forbid reading secular fiction or anything like that, but we focus on Christian made fiction. And there is that expectation that a Christian is going to mean things. This is a person who is in the faith, who is accountable for their beliefs and their practice. So we're not going to go out of our way to promote somebody who seems a little on the borderline, but we're also not going to go out of our way to negatively review the book. Lore Haven right. Reviews focus on the books that are mixed positive or better. Uh, that is our emphasis. We don't do negative reviews if we can help it. However, if in some future uh, scenario, let's say Bill, Bill starts working with Lorehaven. Bill is an amazing best-selling fantasy author. Uh, Bill writes articles. He's on the podcast. We review some of his books. We host him in the guild. And then Lorehaven takes off and gets amazing. And then in the year 2041, Bill apostatizes. Bill, why do you got to do that, Bill? I know you had some celebrity pressures, Bill. I know you had some family issues, Bill. Bill, I know that you had that big movie deal and you went full time uh, and you hit the big leagues, Bill. But Bill, why'd you have to throw away Jesus, Bill, for the mammon, Bill? Bill, we've got to say something at Lorehaven because you were our friend, Bill. You were the chosen one, Bill. So we've got to say something at Lorehaven now in the year 2041 about Bill. Like, you know... We really like Bill's stuff. We're not saying not to buy Bill's stuff, but we've got to say, as far as we can tell, Bill is no longer a biblical Christian. We wish him well. Uh, we wish him success, but we cannot especially promote his books anymore. And then who knows? We may even do a little bit of scrubbing of Bill's stuff. You know, Christian websites have done that before. I would just want to be a little open about it. Like, hey, you were looking for Bill's article. It's no longer here. <laughs> uh, here's why. Link to our article, FAQ page about it. Like, I just spun up this whole scenario. And now, yeah. frankly, I'm going to kind of want to hold me to it. But later, well, if it happens. See, I might push back on that a little bit. Okay. I, I, I kind of look at books like time capsules. You know, if Bill wrote, you know, book ABC when he was really walking in the faith, then I would sort of want to hold on to that and, and even oh, promote, so would I, yeah, I mean, and not scrub it, but, but say like, Hey, you know, Bill, come back, look at what you wrote. Like we, we loved, you know, we, we loved your insights into the faith when you wrote this book and look, anyone can come back, you know, but, um, my, uh, and, and maybe it's because of what I've gone through personally. So I, the, the church I was involved in in college, right after I graduated the, uh, the lead pastor uh, unfortunately walked away uh, from his faith and, and from his marriage. And it was really heartbreaking. Um, and he has since repented. And so there's, there's a good ending to the story uh, mostly, but for months or maybe years after that happened, the church maintained the sermon archive from that pastor. And I just thought that was a really wise and, and compassionate you know, and, and just a hopeful thing of just like, look, these sermons were solid gold. Yes. After, you know, sometime after he preached these, he, he walked away, but in this season, he was walking with the Lord and it's, That's worth, a great point. it's worth remembering that. Right. Now, okay. So no uh, article scrubbing necessarily, but <laughs> would it not make sense then to add an editor's note? Yeah, editor's to note is totally yeah, fine. That is true because come to think of it, I don't like when an article just vanishes like that. It feels yeah. like we're uncomfortable with these issues and I understand that people are, but I'd rather be honest about them. Hey, yeah. Bill wrote some really first-rate fiction back then, a really thoughtful, fantastical stuff, uh, great sci-fi. Bill wrote sci-fi because there's very few Christian sci-fi authors, so we want to hang on to him. Uh, but Bill now got a little, he delved too deep and too greedily into humanism uh, and, and now he's a humanist, you know, and he's, he's living with three people who are not his wife and <sighs> Bill's got issues. So maybe right. we don't scrub his articles, but we got to be honest about it. You got to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. It's just don't memory hold them. Yeah. You know? That makes and, sense. But, but even like, even in the case of that pastor, I started going back and listening to his sermons and go, okay, where did he, where did he start? Wandering? Can you find the early warning signs? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think there's value even in that. It, like, even if you're not a fan, <laughs> spiritual <anymore>. forensics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. 
So, so we've crossed over into chapter three, uh, not seeing the author as an angel, not seeing the author as a devil, but seeing the author is a human. The Christian creator is made in God's image. Let us respect her for that. Let us respect him for that. And Zach, you're already talking about uh, even a pastor or a leader who's made in God's image who does go wandering. Uh, I cannot imagine that that person would have come back to the faith if they'd gotten treated like a devil or an angel. Right, uh, that just right. enables more of the same. It does not reward good behavior. It does not reward coming back to Jesus. You know, coming back to Jesus is going to bring risk, but not that much risk. Uh, you shouldn't yeah. have to uh, still suffer as if you were still apostate. So I have a few thoughts. Uh, if you're aware of Christian authors, like even Christian fantasy authors who seem to be wandering from the faith, who seem to be affirming things that good Christians, wise Christians ought not affirm, I have some thoughts about that. Even an author whose story has some false teaching in there, who has some of what is falsely called gospel, uh, even that author uh, who is verging on heresy in their personal belief or in their book content, I still want to show that person godly sympathy. Uh, and, and Zach, you've already touched on this, actually. Like I, I'm aware of Martin Luther's observation, uh, reported to have observed that even the devil is God's devil. Does that mean I'm urging sympathy for the devil? No. I'm urging no sympathy for the devil, but let's call the devil the devil and not call a human being the devil. Uh, that person could come back. Uh, maybe you don't need to cancel them entirely. Just maybe not support them any more than usual. You know, let's be honest about what's going on. Hey, Bill wrote some great books. Like we, we still like what he wrote here. Uh, but lately what he's turning out is kind of maybe sort of heretical. Um, let's just back away slowly and then politely, uh, enjoy the books that Bill wrote when he was still professing to be a Christian. However, I don't think that even Bill's new books, much less his old books, uh, represent some retconned evil object. Uh, oh no, I, I read Bill's book, you know, that he published in the year 2035 when he was still professing Christian. Like, is it now corrupted because Bill is no longer a Christian? I don't think so. I think we can teach people to discern those things. And if someone feels tempted by the association, then that's an issue that goes deeper than books. Uh, there are passages in scripture that quote Greek poems from people who were never Christians. And the apostle Paul uses those on the way to a direct evangelistic presentation on Mars Hill. I think we can be okay uh, with books by people who claim they're no longer Christians. If the book itself is good, then I think you're right, Zach. It, it doesn't become bad in retrospect. It's, it's still a good book, but that calls for some discernment. I still want to take badly behaving or badly believing authors seriously, but I'm not afraid of them. They may like to think I am like, woo, the fearful Christian. Now I used to hear about you. I used to think you were a myth, but now that I believe this, I see how afraid everyone is of me. And they may feel pretty cool. They may feel pretty edgy. And I'm like, no, dude, I'm oh. not, I'm not afraid of you. It's just kind of yeah. boring. It's just kind of boring. Yeah. There's a, there's a particularly nauseating instinct that I see a lot of people do, uh, that, that come under fire and they're like, Oh, all these people oppose me. I guess I'm on to the right thing. I guess I'm, you know, uh, it, it's sort of that, this that's just like the fundamentalist countercultural thing. Yeah. Yeah. Conservative Christians have done that before. Like, woo, all yes. the world is against me. I feel so powerful yeah, and so it, edgy. Oh yeah. It, it's not a political thing. It, it's a person. It's a narcissism thing. Like it's absolutely narcissism. So I, I just get, I'm so bored by that now. Yeah. And, and we're talking about it now, you know, laughing about it a little bit, but it, it is, it's boring, but it's also kind of tragic. This is not yeah. what art is about. This is not what Jesus is about. If you think you're about art and Jesus, but all you're doing is uh, getting your jollies from hatred, uh, that's, that's not cool. Uh, you're, you're wandering definitely emotionally as well as in your beliefs. Uh, so I'm not afraid of that author. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to give their books to my kids. But if I do, even then, if I'm a good pop culture parent <laughs> trying to teach my kids to engage their world for Christ, that kids can learn. Uh, a couple episodes, uh, we had uh, the returning guests, uh, James R. Hannibal and Marion Jacobs from our Realmakers live stream. And we were talking about uh, similar issues, you know, stories that, uh, that are not all that great in a YA fantasy that has some hazards as well as some blessings. And James Hannibal mentioned the example of uh, giving a YA fantasy novel. He said it was from a Christian publisher. Uh, to his kid to read. And his kid comes to him and say, dad, there's some false teaching in this book. And he said, oh, son, oh, don't be absurd. It's a Christian publisher. <laughs> That's not how he talks. But then he looked at it and went, oh, well, gee, Willikers, you're right. Like, what gives? 
Uh, even then, though, I was glad to hear, and I told him so, that his son recognized it. Why? Because presumably James is a healthy pop culture parent who's teaching his offspring to discern uh, as they get older. Uh, and that's what we need more of. And, you know, bad books with false teachings can help us train to do that. Uh, we needn't necessarily call for an author to be run out on a rail, tarred and feathered and canceled. I don't want to do that any more than I would want to hush up the author's false belief or sin. Uh, if an author is falling, I, I'm not going to yell and point, like, hey, look, he's falling. Let's all laugh and throw rotten vegetables. But I'm also not going to pretend they're not falling. Um, I think a better response is to publicly ignore and privately pray. That's a more biblical response. Yeah. Let us pray for wandering Christian creators while we're speaking openly and honestly about their false beliefs. I, I think that's exactly right. I, I think that takes more courage and self-control, honestly, and that's why it's uh, kind of rare. And it's, uh, you know, I'm looking in the mirror right now, but uh, I, I think there comes a time to, you know, maybe maybe speak up against someone, may, maybe say to their face. Like, I mean, Paul directly confronted Peter to his face. Yes. When Peter Galatians was giving too. into, yeah, when, when Peter was giving into a false gospel, you know, and he brought Peter back. I mean, it's just amazing to think about it, right? Peter, who is, who literally walked with Jesus was, was giving into this false gospel of, uh, from the Judaizers and Paul rebuked him to his face and brought him back. And there's absolutely a place for that in the Christian life. I don't think we talk about that enough. I, I think Social media has has made this whole game so passive aggressive. You don't have to confront someone online. You can directly message them or you can call them. Hey, what do you know? You press 10 digits and you actually get a hold of that person one-on-one or, or hey, visit them in person. It's a lot more scary to do that for sure. Um, and, and then like you said, to publicly or sorry, to privately pray for them, that also takes endurance. I mean, it's just easy to give up on someone throwing the towel. I've got a number of people who I, I think about often and it's, it's my challenge is to always pray for them uh, when they come to mind, because you know what? I, I would rather a wandering Christian creator or even a syncretizing or even a apostatizing Christian. I would so much rather see them come back to the faith. I would rather them be on our side and see their talents get used again for the kingdom than just cut them off and let their talents be used for the world and the flesh and the devil. Who knows if that'll happen? I, I have friends right now that I have several friends in my head who are shouting Hebrews six at me. Uh, I'm not going to go into that Hebrews. Uh, you know, can they actually come back? Were they ever a part of the faith to begin with? I'm not oh, going to go into that. That's another concession stand item. Yeah. <laughs> just grab it We're not going to go into the theology on that. Right, but look, right. I'm just saying in my heart, that's what I, that's what I hope for. I, I want to work alongside them again for the same kingdom. Yeah. I think that that kind of prayer is so important, that posture of humility, yet also firm foundation on the word of God. Some people think that those are opposites. They are not so. They are not so. Uh, there is a kind of love that will not enable false teaching or bad behavior. And that is the kind of love to which we are called in the gospel. Uh, another uh, result of that humility, I think, is obviously the text. The exact reference escapes me, but let everyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And I referenced this at the beginning of the show. You start a podcast, you start a website, you put some books out here and there. Like even if we're not huge, like Christian celebrity X, you know, we are still vulnerable. Uh, we are still under the accountability of this expectation for us. Uh, just speaking more personally here, like I'm, I'm not even famous and yet I feel a few, uh, pressures that I think are fairly normal for somebody who's trying to be a Christian creator. So I can empathize a little bit, you know, like I know I'm not an angel or a devil. I'm a human, uh, formerly fallen now being redeemed by Jesus Christ. And so other Christian authors, creators, they're not angels or devils. Uh, they're my enemies. Maybe if they're outside the faith, like it kind of counts as an enemy there. But they're also my neighbors. A person can be a neighbor and your enemy. It's amazing. You look through the wisdom literature and like the categories get a little blurred there. Uh, I think that that especially helps me when I see people get frustrated with Christian creators. Like, well, they, they didn't reply to my uh, comment or, you know, that person is just so aloof that they can't respond. You know, when I have this issue with their book or something, uh, I think I just. I can sympathize with that increasingly because I, Zach, I'm starting to hear that some here and there. Like I'm starting to 
like not follow up with some of the social media conversations. And like, even the guild is starting to get away with me. I can't read every single comment posted in the guild. Uh, that's just that's me okay. trying to be a better use of, it's just me trying to steward my time uh, as effectively as I can. You know, I have family to take care of and a day job and all of that stuff. Uh, authors too, Christian creators can just be super busy and they may not be able to reply or interact with every fan. Uh, also, I'm sympathetic to authors who develop their career over decades and do nothing else. I mean, it's not like they also have a parallel career track in uh, IT. Uh, some of them, this is all they do as the creative type stuff. And if they feel that they're wandering in the faith or they feel they have to make some kind of compromise or something, I may disagree, but I'm also sympathetic because if they don't do that, boom, it's all over. Uh, and at best, then they have to go work at the checkout counter at a grocery store. Uh, that's not terrible, but once you've gotten to be a popular author, like I can imagine like not wanting to fall that far. And I can imagine feeling creatively trapped in that kind of job too. If you lose the first love there, um, that's a big issue that can lead towards compromise. I think another issue, and this actually applies to plenty of secular creators as well, including the hapless and abusive Joss Whedon we mentioned earlier. I think that creators can bear the overblown expectations of fans to give them this paradise type experience in their next book or their movie or something. Uh, and no human being is able to bear such a weight. No angel is able to bear such a weight. Only Christ can bear that kind of weight. And if you overload that author or that creator with expectations for an amazing experience, it's no wonder they may turn uh, to drink or false doctrine or whatever to try to cope with that. Um, I still disagree and they're still responsible for their choices, but I can be sympathetic. I can be sympathetic to that. Uh, good authors will need to train to resist those kinds of pressures and they also need to train to steward their time well. Uh, they're not able to interact uh, with with every fan and I think we ought not to expect that they will. Just real quick, drawing to a close, unless you have anything else, Zach, like that's one of our secondary missions at Lorehaven, I realized while thinking about this episode. We want to train to have that biblical view of Christian creators. Of course, Lorehaven focuses on fans and not writers. That's a big reason. We're not just trying to be the big cheese celebrity Christian creators or act like there's a chosen one author uh, who's going to bring Christian made fantasy to the public awareness and make us all rich and famous. We want to enjoy these stories because they're great. We want to enjoy them for the glory of God. And a side benefit of that is it helps us back off of the author worship just a little bit. Not only because these stories are still fairly obscure when compared with the grand scheme of things, but because that's what Jesus calls us to do, is to look at art and creations, uh, sub-creations and stories in perspective. They are a gift from him, and therefore we have to enjoy the gift according to God's rules. We need to train ourselves for how we think and feel and pray for authors who do fail, who do buckle under the pressure, or who wander from biblical truth. And if we share faith with that author in Jesus, then we don't want to worship that person anyway. We don't want the author trying to worship the fans by pleasing them through their stuff. And we as fans don't want to be worshiping that author. Together, we're all going to be the same, worshiping Jesus forever. Nobody's going to be sitting way up front, you know, showing partiality by the angels in heaven. And nobody's going to be the poor person, the unfamous person sitting way in the back everybody's going to be worshiping Jesus. Different gifts, different talents, maybe even different levels of authority in the kingdom, but all made one, all made into sons and daughters and adopted by our king, the only celebrity we should be worshiping. Well, for our comm station today, uh, we've got uh, a lot of great discussions going on about our previous episode on Wheel of Time, and it's happening in the Lorehaven Guild. So if you'd like to be a part of that conversation, jump on in the guild. Uh, we've got a number of people that have had really insightful comments. You know, it's it's sad to see a lot of people have have canceled the show. You know, they haven't canceled Amazon, but they've just kind of given up on it. Uh, or some other people are saying, hey, I'm going to dive into the books or I'm going to reread the books or I've, hey, I've bought all of the books because I've heard so much about the books. I can't wait to read it. So there is some great conversation happening and we would love to hear your feedback on this episode, who <laughs> maybe don't name drop the uh, creators that you've had to give up on or cancel, but you know, if you've got some thoughts on today's episode about how to handle 
when, when fandoms and creators disappoint you. Uh, that's kind of our meta theme here. Uh, last couple episodes. If you'd like to share your thoughts with us, send us an email to podcast at lorehaven.com. Or you can, if you're on the webpage for this episode, scroll down and there's a comment box. You can leave uh, some suggestions below or find us on social media. Just look for Lorehaven. Be sure to subscribe free as well at lorehaven.com. You can get the super secret invite to join the Lorehaven Guild, and we will post every episode of Fantastical Truth in a dedicated channel for this podcast. You can then send us your notes that way as well. Ask questions about the episode, interact with us because we're the big podcast celebrities, uh, and explore this topic together, hopefully for the glory of God and the good of our Christian creator neighbors. Speaking of Christian creative neighbors, we're going to have a few more of those in our virtual studios at Fantastical Truth. Next month, February 2022, we are approaching our 100th episode. It's actually going to release, as I figure it, on Tuesday, February the 22nd, 2022. So a lot of twos there. Uh, Great voices, some of whom we've been aware of for quite some time, are going to be joining us on the podcast. We're going to explore the fantastical stories they've made. Uh, We're going to share the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, It's going to be a great time. And yet we also want to keep in mind the principles that we've worked through in this episode, applying first to ourselves as we get to meet these uh, amazing folks. Uh, We are all in service to Jesus, not to the creators themselves, uh, not even to the stories themselves. But it's for his glory that we do all of this as fans or creators of these stories as we continue to seek and find his fantastical truth. 